Good morning and welcome to Live Oak Church. We are so happy that you've chosen to worship with us this morning. Would you stand with us as we turn our hearts to the Lord, remembering his goodness and his grace this morning. Good morning. 
Welcome to Live Oak Church. We're so very glad to have you today. Welcome. Those of you who are watching online, we're so glad that you are uh, here. Um, Travis, who is normally doing the announcements these days, he's not here. He's recovering from gallbladder surgery. So, um, Travis, I hope you're watching online. hope you're getting plenty of rest. Come back soon, brother. Well, we're so very glad that you're here today. Uh, if this is your first Sunday, we're, we're ultra, incredibly uh, grateful that you are chosen to worship with us today. Um, after the service, if this is your first day, take this green card that you filled out, take it back there to the Get Info station, and we have an awesome little gift for you uh, for that. We encourage everyone to fill out one of these green connection cards and turn it in uh, and give us as much information as you feel comfortable doing so uh, at the end of the service in the offering. So if you did not get a bulletin today, now today is more um, important than normal. So if you didn't get one, raise your hand so these awesome fellows in the back can get you one. So we have one over there, one over there. Make sure they get one because you may have go gone ahead and looked in your bulletin and kind of <coughs> checked things out and you saw, oh my gosh, what's going on? Well, uh, the elders and the deacons, we got together um, and we began to pray about um, what to do as the service is beginning, our church is beginning to fill up. Now, I knew this was going to happen. The day that I announced that we're going to go to two services, we had have several families gone. You're like, why do we need to go to two services? There's plenty of room. Well, normally, we, you know, things are filling up. And so uh, we just, you know, we ha are pushing the boundaries of comfort level for we want visitors to feel comfortable to make sure that they have a seat um, and that kind of thing. And so, you know, anybody will tell you, once you get to about 80% capacity, then it's really too full, especially for a church that doesn't have a lobby or anything like that. Um, but, and then technically, according to the CDC, we're not supposed to be over 50% capacity. And so with that in line and seeing how we're having more and more people visit, more and more, more people come in, we felt the need that it is time for us to go to two services. Now, we can't do that unless everybody buys in. We have to make room for more people to show up. We have to make room for more people to come in here because the point of Live Oak Church is not for us to be a holy huddle, but for us to reach people who are outside of here for the kingdom of God. And so that's the point of Live Oak Church. So we want everyone to be able to make room. And so we're having two services. The two services will begin on February the, holy cow, 21st. Okay, um, February, I got all these dates running around my head. February 21st, it'll be, this service will be the same, and we'll have a 9 o'clock service. What I need from each of you Live Oakers, those of you who are members, those of you who call Live Oak home, what I need from you is to write on that sheet, mark on that sheet which service you would rather go to, and don't just say, uh, whatever. No, I need to know which one you'd rather go to, and... Are you willing to serve in one of those areas? Because we're just now able to staff our kids' ministry, our nursery ministry, and our coffee ministry, all these kind of things. So if we're going to have two services, we need more workers for the kids' ministry, more workers for, for the nursery ministry, those kind of things. And so please, on that sheet, mark which service you would like to come to and where you would like to serve. It's very, very, very important. And so, because we believe that God is on the move, we believe that there is a lot of great things happening here at Live Oak Church, and we would like you to help us out with that. Speaking of that, next week is our Discover Live Oak course. Right after uh, church on uh, Sunday, we have um, the uh, Discover Live Oak is kind of what we would call our membership class. It is um, about two hours long. We feed you lunch, and we tell you everything there is to know about the DNA of Live Oak Church. Now, this doesn't make you a member. It's just you can't become a member unless you come to this class. You know, so um, afterwards you may say, nah, I'm good just sitting here. That's fine, you know, but if you want to become a member, come on. Um, it's really, uh, it, it's, I think it's an enjoyable time. You get free lunch. It's going to be lovely. So you can just mark down on here. Count me in. We have child care. Let us know if you need that, um, or you can sign up online as well. And then final but most important announcement of the day is tonight at 6.30. We have been uh, going through, throughout this month, we have dis designated 2021 as the season of prayer for Live Oak Church. This entire month, we've had daily 
uh, prayer and devotion uh, services online. And then now, tonight, we're going to have the culmination of this service, of this series, of a prayer and night of, wor- night of worship and prayer. And it's going to be amazing. It's going to be a wonderful, intimate, beautiful time of worship, some guided prayer for each of us. And so I encourage every one of you to be here. If you can, bring a friend. This is that time. If you've been struggling with health and you need pr- praying, come tonight. If you're confused, if you're frustrated about what's going on in the world, come tonight and pray. The, the time for this, the, the thing for you to do as a believer in Jesus Christ is not to get on Facebook and complain about it. As a Christian, it's to get on your knees and pray about it. And so tonight, I encourage all of you to be here at 6.30, and it's going to be a wonderful time, a, a wonderful night of prayer and worship. All right? So let's pray, and let's wor- do that worshiping thing right now. Lord, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for this moment we have as, as believers to come and to worship. Thank you, God, for this moment we have just to, to pause our week, that the, the busyness and all the mess and all the drama that we get to just pause for a second and just worship you because you are worthy of our worship. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for what you're continuing to do in and through us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. As we continue in worship this morning, we are kind of wrapping up our series on the Lord's Prayer, and we're focusing in on that phrase, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That's such an important part of our prayer lives, that we would daily pray that God would guard us and protect us and deliver us from temptation and from evil, because as Christians, we are in a daily battle. We're in a fight for holiness, a fight for growth, a fight to be more like Jesus and to worship Him better. And so I want us to keep that in mind as we sing today, that God would uh, strengthen us and that we would depend on the power of his Holy Spirit to change us, to help us grow, to deliver us from temptation and evil. Will you stand and sing with us? Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. Stay on. 
I'll stay When you move, I'll move I will follow you When you love, I'll love How you serve, I'll serve If this life I lose I will follow Where you go, I'll go Where you stay, I'll stay When you move, I'll move I will follow you When you love, I'll love How you serve, I'll serve Lord, if more of you 
Thank you so much for today. Thank you for another day of life. Thank you that we can come and gather as your church and worship you together. We thank you for giving us your word, and we thank you for this time we have now to open up your word and study and to hear from you, and we praise you for what you're doing in this place today. We pray that you would just receive all the glory that you deserve, and we just give this day to you. Amen. You may be seated. If you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 11, Luke chapter 11. Uh, we have been in Luke since last Christmas. Last Christmas, we've been going verse by verse through Luke. Took a little break uh, during Easter, but then we're back in Luke. Uh, and, and then as we um, came to the beginning of this year, Luke 11 came, and the Lord had already laid on my spirit that this was going to be, he really wanted uh, our people to be a people of prayer, and sure enough, Luke 11 begins with Jesus' disciples saying, Lord, teach us to pray, and so for the last four weeks, five, this will be the fifth week, we have been kind of unpacking the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer not being a prayer that we're supposed to recite verbatim, but he gave us a model for the prayer, and so we started with the first week talking about Father, hallowed be thy name. And, and so we looked at the idea that we are adopted, we are adopted children, that God is our Father. And we come to that understanding, you're able to really, that, that should begin with a, with a very humbling state when you recognize that God is your Father, that he adopted you, that he brought you into his family. And then we looked at the kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We looked at the idea of what God's kingdom on earth should look like, what we're trying to strive for as people of God, and then give us each day our daily bread. And we talked about what it means for God to provide for us. And, and we make our, when we make our hearts right with him, what those provisions should look like. And then we talked about last week, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And just this idea of how difficult it is to forgive those who have wronged us. But once we recognize that we are forgiven, um, that it is paramount to our faith as believers. And today we're looking in, uh, we're continuing on as we finish this prayer, and lead us not into temptation. And then Matthew says, um, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And so that is God's word. Let us pray, and we'll jump in to the sermon. God, thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. May we be faithful and true to the context and to the purpose of your word today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There's something about doing uh, something when you're told not to do it, right? There's just something about if you're told not to do it, you just want to do it. I mean, it, it, it's just in us, especially men. I get it. You know, I, I say this all the time, you know, most of men's issues, you know, I would say there's a, if you go to a, uh, if you go to a cemetery, 
you know, you could probably see most of the men's last words would be, hey, watch this. You know, because you know, men, you know, we typically aren't very smart. And if we're told not to do something, we tend to do it. If I took, if I leave a box, if I take a box, just a plain box, and my kids are in the living room, and I lay it right smack dab on the table in the living room, and I leave the living room, they won't touch it, they won't look at it. I know that because they don't touch their own stuff and look at it, you know, and so they'll leave it there until it decays, you know, and, and, and you know, withers away. But if I lay that same box on that table in the living room, and my kids are there, and I say, do not look in that box. It will drive them absolutely insane. They will go nuts. They will try to convince the other one. They will convince, you know, the oldest daughter who just turned 18. She'll try to convince the middle daughter who just turned 15 today, to, you know, to open the box. Both of them, they've gotten, you know, uh, uh, you know disciplined enough in their lives. I'm not going to do it. And so they'll pin it on their 10-year-old, you know, brother, my son, and they'll get him to open it. I don't want, he probably didn't even want to open it, but the girls convinced him to open it, and they're going to open it. That's just how we're built. You know, we will do things that we don't even really want to do. We talked about that last week. We were talking about sin. The first time I smoked a cigarette, I, cigarettes stink. I mean, why, we do it because we're just drawn to it. There are things that we, that we may not even want to or care about, but because we know we're not supposed to do it, we do it. It's that sinful nature that we have. The temptation is almost too much to bear. Why? It's because the constant battle between our godly nature, our new nature in Christ, and our sinful nature. It is still hardwired into us since the fall of man, since that first time that, that the, the Eve took the fruit off the, the, the vine. This, since that moment into, up until now, it is still hardwired into us, that sinful nature. And Jesus knew that, and that is why he finished his model prayer with the statement that we unpack. Lead us not into temptation. Well, let's start first off by recognizing that God doesn't truly lead us in temptation anyway. God doesn't, God doesn't tempt us. In James 1, 13 and 14, it says, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. So God doesn't tempt us anyway. He doesn't tempt us. He doesn't lead us into temptation. And so we're praying, God, do not, you know, keep us away. Keep us away from that temptation because every day you're tempted. You wake up every day. And every day there are going to be opportunities for you to embrace holiness or embrace temptation, embrace sinfulness. And so today we're going to unpack a couple of things and I'm going to try to actually be quick, okay? And I said that earlier. I said, it should be a short sermon today. And Cheryl laughed at me. And so I didn't appreciate that. I'm going to try because we're going to two services and so I can't be up here rambling forever. But, but we, you know, so, uh, so I'm going to try. But we have three things that we learn about temptation from the Lord's Prayer. Number one, we have an enemy who wants to destroy us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. What we learn from that is that there is an enemy. You know, it's very popular today in, in some Christian circles that they want to acknowledge the whole idea of love. They love the red letters of Jesus. They love the idea of peace and love and joy and forgiveness. They, they love that. But no one wants to acknowledge the other side of that coin. We want to stay on this side of, uh, of, of the gospel, of forgiveness and, and grace and, and peace and love and joy. And I do too. I would love to sit here. I would love to live here and not go anywhere else. But there is another side of the gospel, and that is that there is an adversary. There is a devil. There is a hell. It is there. It is real. It is true. There is an adversary. There is an enemy, and he wants to destroy us. C.S. Lewis says there are two, er two errors we face when it comes to the belief in devil. One is to fail to believe in their existence, and the other is to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. And I have seen that take place in the church. Either you don't want to acknowledge it all. You just want to live here and not worry about evil and not even acknowledge the devil or hell or anything. 
or you want to be this guy over here. And preacher, why don't you talk about sin and hell? Because people didn't talk about. I'm, I don't want to dwell there. I don't. I don't want to. I don't want to sit here and just. I mean, if you go to church and you hear more about hell than you hear about the love of Christ, and <laughs> why go there? My gosh, who wants to live there? I mean, I mean. So uh, you know, you, you some people just spend too much time focusing on hell and the, and the adversary and the demons, and they become focused. And there are some people that just get enhammered with the whole demonic side of things and, and you know in the for the sake of spiritual faith and christianity but you you got to be careful not to get drawn too far into this because you can get drawn too far into be worrying about uh, about spiritual attack every you start seeing the boogeyman around every corner you start seeing you start seeing demonic attack around every corner you know what the 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 devil got me he attacked me. No, you made a dumb choice. Stop seeing the devil everywhere. The devil didn't turn the light red. You ran late because you slept in, okay? Can we just stop blaming the devil on everything? You know, so some of us stay too much over here and some of us stay too much over here. But there is an enemy, and he does want to destroy us. The Bible is clear that there is a devil. He's called by many names in Scripture. He's called the adversary. He's called the accuser. He's called the ruler of the world. He's called the tempter. He's called a roaring lion. He's called the thief. Whatever he is called, two things are true. Number one, he is real. And number two, he hates you. Okay? He is real and he hates you. Understand that the devil does not like you. I don't care how cool or rebellious you are. I don't care how many black outfits you wear or you know, I, I don't I'm, you know, when I I did youth ministry for 25 years and dealing with some of these emo kids and you know, they would wear the black and they'd have the black eyeliner and piercings all over like they just you know made out with a tackle box you know it's just there you know it's just piercings everywhere and so and you're like and you have to test like you know they're like man when i get you know you know hell's gonna be a party it's like no you no you're being used because satan hates you like he hates every one of god's creations he doesn't there is no there's no party in hell he hates you. He despises you. And we have to understand that there is a spiritual war going on. Ephesians 6, 10, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through 12, it's very clear that there is a spiritual warfare going on, that there is an enemy that despises you, that hates you. And so we need to understand that. We need to believe that. As believers, we have to, we have to grasp that. There is a devil, and he hates you. And he wants to do everything he can to destroy your heart. And if he can't pluck you away from God, he'll make you miserable till you blame God. So things we learned about the temptation for the Lord's Prayer, number one, we have an enemy who wants to destroy us. Number two, we will face challenges that will test us. Expect the test and the trials. 1 Peter 4, 12 through 13 says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. Much discouragement, much discouragement happens in our life as Christians because we have been taught a false gospel. We have been taught that if you believe in Jesus, everything's going to be all right. You're going to experience all the blessings of the world. No, that ain't how it happens. That's not true. If you embrace that idea that if I just become a Christian, then all the, all the problems will go away, all those tests will go away, all those trials will go away. That's not true. It's not how it works. It, 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 it just doesn't even pass the smell test. If you look at, I would say Jesus is, Jesus is God. He's the son of God. And, and he hung on the cross and he was, a, you know, he was beaten. He was flogged. He was deceived. He was lied to. He was, I mean, look at all that. And, and yet Jesus endured trials. What makes you think that you won't? 
You will endure trials. We're promised that we will. And Peter said, you know, Peter said, do not be surprised at the tr- not only the trial, the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you. And I love how he had, as though something strange is happening to you. But rejoice. Now, I don't know about you. I'm willing to acknowledge when I go through hard times, I'm willing to acknowledge, okay, all right, this is part of the attack of the enemy. This is part of life. This is part of the journey. This is what we live in a sinful world. I'm willing to acknowledge hard times. It takes a lot of spiritual discipline to rejoice in the hard times. I mean, I don't know about you, but when you're in the midst of a bad day, it's hard to go, whoo, praise the Lord. Man, what a horrible day. Praise the Lamb. No, I mean, I, man, I don't know. Sometimes you have one of those bad days. It just seems like the enemy is attacking you, just, just, just oppressive, just yucky. Nothing bad necessarily, just one of those yucky days. You get up and it's like, really, is this day over yet? I mean, you know, and it's, it just starts off that way. And my poor small group, our life group, Thursday night, I was just grumpy. And I was like, man, I can't cancel my life group because I'm grumpy. And they came in, they're like, how are you doing? I'm like, ah, I, I, I'm just grumpy. I'm just grumpy. I just, you know, I'm sorry. You know, and I, and I, I just went ahead and apologized in case I, you know, said something offensive. Um, and so it, it's just one of those, sometimes we just get the grumps. In the midst of that time, you need to stop and you need to pause and say, Lord, thank you that I'm living a life worthy of being attacked. Now, I don't always do that. I don't want to do that. I'm grumpy. I'm angry. And I don't want to do that. But that's what, the, well, that's what he's talking about. Rejoice that you are sharing in the trials of Christ. Because here's the thing. If you are not living a life of boldness, of holiness there would be no reason for the enemy to waste his time on you. And so when you're truly enduring trials, when you're truly enduring spiritual attack, rejoice because you have been deemed worthy of an attack by the enemy. Now, again, that's preacher talk. Harder to do, but that's where we need to get to. That's that's where we need to strive to. That's the journey. You're going to be tested, and the question is, what will the test reveal about you? What will the test reveal about your character? What will, what will it reveal about your commitment to the spiritual disciplines? What, when, when you're tested, what is it going to reveal about your commitment to prayer? We talked about this at the beginning of the series, about how important prayer is in the life of a Christian and how usually prayer comes, desperate prayer, not just now I'll lay me down to sleep prayer, but desperate prayer only comes when we're at the end of our rope, not recognizing we had the whole length of the rope to go to God. We wait until we're at the end of the rope to get to God. And so when we are tested, it tests, it reveals our commitment to prayer. It reveals our commitment to God's word because if you truly are in God's word, if you truly study God's word, all of a sudden you're be- you begin to understand what it is you're supposed to follow, well, who it is you're supposed to follow. You would understand that these trials, that these temptations are part of life, that you wouldn't see it as God punishing you. You would know what God says about these things. So it reveals your commitment to God's word. It reveals your commitment to community. If all of a sudden you look around and you're just being attacked spiritually and you have no one to go to to have them pray for you for, you recognize that I have been doing this journey, this faith journey all alone, and that's not how it's supposed to be done. You see, you may be on the mountaintop spiritually right now. You may be just literally just like, man, I'm so close to God. I mean, it's like, gee, I could... Tickle the toes of Christ. I'm so close to God. I'm just on a mountaintop. That might be you right now, but you will experience a valley. You will experience a dark time. You will experience a struggle in your life, and that's when you need people in your life. That's when you need a a life group. That's when you need people that you can go to and say, I'm done. I know that God is with me. I know he loves me, but my gosh, I'm so done. I need someone to pray for me. 
We need that person in our life. We need that, that, that community. We can't do this on our own. But when, when the trials come, when the, when the temptations come, it, it, what it does, it pressures you and it reveals what comes out is what's revealed about your commitment to prayer, to God's word, and to community. The third thing it does is, is it recognizing that the real enemy is evil, not suffering. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Notice he didn't say, deliver us from struggle. That's never the prayer. Nowhere in the Lord's prayer does it say, deliver me from struggle. Deliver us from evil. But see, the thing is, we, especially Americans, confuse those things. A struggle is evil. Things aren't supposed to be hard. It's supposed to be easy. Think, I want things to work right now. I just want things to work. John Piper is a um, uh, very um, popular author and pastor, and he says that all of our experiences in life are either tests from God that bring health and good things, or they're temptations from Satan that bring death and destruction. In life, the real enemy is evil, not pain. The real life is, the, the enemy in life is evil, not pain. You see, we have to be careful. You know, we ask for God to deliver us from struggle when he's trying to teach us through the struggle. It's evil, not circumstances. Sin can ruin you. Suffering can restore you. You see, we're saying, deliver me from evil. Not necessarily deliver me from suffering. In the midst of evil, you need to say, Lord, bring me, get me out of this. If you are stuck, if you are, if you are stuck in, in, in an addiction to alcohol or uh, drugs or pornography, you need to say, Lord, that, that's evil. And that is what you need to say, Lord, bring me out of, restore me out of, get me, lead me out of that. That's evil. If you're in an adulterous affair or, or an unhealthy relationship, then you, that is sin. That's evil. You say, Lord, get me out of that. A struggle. You see, a struggle we want out of as quickly as possible, but a struggle is something that we can learn from, that God can mold us and create in us something amazing. Too often we, we're desperate to get out of the struggle, and God's like, no, 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 I'm teaching you through the struggle. I, I, I'm creating something beautiful through this struggle. Now, no one wants to be in the struggle, but in the midst of the struggle, it's like, Lord, what are you teaching me here? I said not too long ago, I think it was on one of our daily devotions that, you know, um, whenever, no, I answered was one of the blogs I wrote. Whenever I'm bringing someone on to my leadership team, especially hiring on to staff, one of the things I've noticed over my, my years that I've learned is I don't ever want to hire someone that has had an easy life. I've hired a couple of those people and they're pretty, forgive me, useless. They're just, you know, I mean, so if you've had an easy life, I'm not saying you're useless. You just won't be on my staff. Um, but anyway, um, but you know, I, I just realized that, you know, because it, it, it's things, they just expect things to come so easy. And so they, it's hard for them to think outside the box. It's hard for them to, to push through. What I have found is people who have, I've interviewed and I found out they have a past and they've had to struggle through some things. They've had to fight through some things. Those are the people I want on my team. Because they've learned to persevere, they've learned to push through those struggles, and they've learned how God has taught them through some struggles. And they, you know, uh, and plus they're usually a little off, and so am I, and so we can kind of understand each other. And so, and, and so, I, you know, I relate to that. But, but when you know, as you go through life, you know, don't always say, "Lord, you know, deliver me through the struggle, deliver me from the struggle." That's never, that's not in the prayer. Deliver me from evil. Lead me not into temptation. Take, Lord, allow me to embrace holiness. That is the prayer. 
Pray that God would deliver you from evil, not challenge. Learn the difference. Coal under heat turns to ash. If I put a bunch of coals on my grill and I light it on fire, it's going to turn to ash and burn away. Coal under pressure turns into a diamond. Coal under heat turns to ash. Coal under pressure turns into a diamond. Your life under evil, under sin, will turn to ash. Your life under pressure will reveal a diamond. That's good. Y'all need to tweet that. That's, that's, that's good. I don't know. Uh, uh, if y'all just sit there doing your grocery list, I don't know. But I, I came up with that. That was, that was good. All right. So how does God deliver us from evil? John 10, 24. So the Jews gathered around him and said, I love this. How long will you keep us in suspense? If you're the Christ, would you tell us already? Well, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe because you're not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life. And they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. How does God deliver us from evil? Because we do, he, he does it because he does it through leading us. You see, if you are pursuing Christ, by definition, you can't be pursuing evil. If you're pursuing Jesus, you can't be pursuing evil. If every day I'm drawing, I'm leaning into God. I'm leaning into Jesus and his will into my life. His will is never going to lead me into evil. I'm not going to be so close to Jesus, following him so closely into his footsteps. There's no way if I'm doing that, I'm going to trip into pornography or if I'm going to trip into lying or trip into stealing or trip into whatever. It doesn't work that way. If you're leaning into Jesus, if you're leaning into him, if you are following him like a sheep follows the shepherd, if you're truly following the Lord and listening for the Lord, you're going to be led to holiness, not temptation, not sin. Well, how does that happen? Because we know his voice. Well, how do you know his voice? Number one, you have to know Jesus. You have to follow him. That begins with a decision. That begins with your salvation experience. You know, sometimes we end with a salvation experience. Sometimes we end with that. You know, we can say, we can even say, my spiritual birthday is this. You know, you remember the moment that you surrendered your life to Jesus. So the first thing you have to do is have that moment in life where you say, okay, I'm done. I've tried to do life on my own. I can't do it on my own anymore. Jesus, I give you my life. I surrender my life to you. So that's the first step. You have to know Jesus. You have to follow him. Secondly, you have to know his voice. You have to pray. You have to, you have to be in a daily communication with God. You have to be able to hear his voice and know his voice. You have to be able to, as Psalm 46 says, to be still and know that he is God. Other versions say, stop striving. Just stop for a minute. Just be still and know. Be still and listen. Have that moment every day. Sean, you don't know how busy I am. Five minutes. Turn off the TV. Turn off the Facebook. Turn off something every day. Just give him some time to where you can train your ear and hear the voice. Now, I don't have a sheep. This is, Monk, this is John's Island, but still, I don't have a sheep. I don't have any farm animals. I have a dog. But Maxie, my dog, her birthday was yesterday, so sweet. Um, but Maxie, my dog, she loves to escape. Last week, she escaped, and the neighborhood knows her by now, and so they'll post on, um, Maxie got out, you know, that kind of thing. And then when she comes back from, on her, from her adventure, it's so funny because she has this big grin. <laughs> like, Dad, I went on an adventure. That's so awesome. I'm like, no, that's not good. And she's, she doesn't understand how that wasn't a good thing. 
But when she can go on this big adventure, she can go running away. And all I have to do is clap my hands. Max, hey! And I can hear. And she comes running. Other people can call her name. And she's just going to do her thing. But when I call, Max, hey! She knows my voice. You see, when the Lord calls, do you know his voice? When he's trying to reveal something to you, do you know his voice? We've all had that moment in our life where we were, where we were in front of a decision. We had two options to make. and We don't know what to do because we don't hear his voice. We don't know his voice. Is this God or is this the enemy? Is this God or is this something else? I don't know because I don't know his voice. Know him. Number two, know his voice. Number three, know God's ways. Well, how do we do that? We have to know his word. You see, so, so many people, we think we hear his voice, and he calls us to do things. And whenever they come to me, I'm like, man, pastor, I'm telling you, God told me to do this. And I'm like, no, he didn't. You can't tell me what God told, didn't tell me to do. Yes, I can, because it has to line up with his word. If it doesn't line up with his word, then it can't be God. He won't contradict himself. He won't deceive you that way. And the only way you can do that, the only way you can to reconcile that is to know his word. And so you have to know Jesus. You have to know his voice. You have to know his ways, and that's his word. And you have to know each other, and that's community. That's how God delivers us from evil, by knowing Jesus, by knowing his voice, by knowing his ways, and by knowing each other. You have to have, there, you know, we, in our church, we have this, we have this um, call it a program, call it a, a, a strategy for discipleship. Too many churches, discipleship is you sitting there and me teaching and transferring knowledge from my mouth to your brain. That's not discipleship. That's teaching. Discipleship is I'm on this journey and I may be one step, two step, 20 steps ahead of you, but I'm taking you with me. That's discipleship, walking together to holiness. And so life groups is part of that. This is part of that. You learning and then you go to life groups and we go like my life group on Thursday nights. We come together and we say, okay, let's look at that. Let's talk about how can we do this better. And so we chew up God's word together. We hold each other accountable. We share prayer requests. And then a, another, uh, another section deeper, I have two men that I meet with on the regular. And we'll either have coffee or lunch, and not, we'll just talk together. We'll share life together, and we get deeper into accountability together. And so if that particular person or if I am starting to drift, they have the right to just get all up in my business and say, no, that is wrong. That's, you've got to stop. It's that next level. It's that... You see, that's why we need community. That's how God uses us together to deliver us from evil, to hold us accountable. So what's the conclusion? Let's unpack the prayer that Jesus gave us. Our Father, Daddy, who adopted us into his family, hallowed be your name. There is no one like you. Your kingdom come, your will be done. May we do what we can to make earth more like heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Provide for us our basic needs. Forgive us as we forgive others. Lead us not into temptation. May we distinguish between evil and challenges. In Jesus' name, amen. So how do we respond today? I just want us to think about two things and then we'll be done. Number one, what challenges are you mistaking for evil? And number two, what evil are you getting too close to on the regular? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for this time we have together. And God, I thank you for the time we have to come to, to, to gather as believers and to gather as those who are searching and to come and to study your word. And thank you for your word, God. Thank you for that model prayer that you gave us for those disciples to step up and ask, Lord, teach us to pray. Because so often our prayer life is just a laundry list of things that I need instead of coming to you and saying, Lord, how can I be more like you? And so, God, right now, I just ask that, that we would come together and that we would pray, Lord, lead us away from the, those temptations that snag us, those temptations that, that tangle us up, that evil. And 
God, I just pray that we would press into you daily. Press into you. And as we become more like you, as we become holy, the temptations are so much more difficult to get snagged into. May we be more like you. May we honor you in all that we do and all that we say in Jesus' name. Amen. Take a moment and pray. Live Oak, how are you? My name is not Skip Hillsley, but everybody calls me that, so we'll just go with that. I am married to the wonderful lady on the computer back there, Cheryl. We're in our 27th year of marriage, so. Yeah. Um, one of the things that happens when you get a little bit older. I've learned, and Cheryl can attest to this, is my hearing isn't as good as it used to be. And so bear with me, just please. Carrie asked me if I would do this little offering thing, and of course, yes. Then I made the mistake of asking Sean, how much time do I get? <laughs> so he said, 25 minutes. And I'm like, great! Because I have a lot I could say. And then as I was preparing, Cheryl said, this seems like it's going to be too long. I said, well, Sean said I got 25 minutes. She said, mm, he probably said two to five minutes. <laughs> I was like, doggone it. But anyway, so we've been walking with the Lord since, since we've been married. I've, I've been walking with the Lord since before we've been married. We're married, and, sh and she was as well. But uh, we... we our own experience with our finances is that it wasn't great. I had a good job. We were getting our bills paid, but we felt like we're, we must be doing something wrong because we're not getting ahead. You know, so I think it's one of the things that made us start thinking about how worldly our thoughts were and our understanding was. And so having a, a worldly understanding of finances is what put us in the position we were in. So we did a Dave Ramsey. What was it? Larry Burkett. Like course, you know, about how to, how to change, uh, you know, the way you deal with finances. Anyway, what, uh, what we learned especially was one of the things that, that I think – we came to realize about money and about our, our relationship with the Lord and how that ties in with it was that maybe we had a wrong idea of what the offering, what our money was being given for. And so I think hopefully others may have that the same kind of an issue, but we came to realize that our, we're not given money to support the work of the church. That's not... That's, I mean, that's an idea that we had, but that's, not, that's a wrong idea because the money we give is out of worship and out of love for the Lord. It's not to support the work of the church, although the money does support the work of the church. But having that, having that little change in our understanding of what this is about made a world of difference. And likewise, with the, with the leadership of a church... They have to also be careful that they don't look at the, at the money that the congregation is giving is what we need to run the church. So both sides have to keep God at the forefront and that our giving is to God as an act of worship and as a, an expression of our faith. Cheryl has a little sign over our sink that says, Faith is 
acting like you believe God is telling you the truth. And so, and the message today was spot on with everything that's been going through my mind in that, you know, we need to understand, we need to know God, we need to know Jesus, we need to know his word, and we need to act on our faith. So our offerings, one of, we want our offering to be pleasing to God, and the Bible says without faith it's impossible to please God. So I think that just changed the way we looked at it, and I will say that back in that day when we started tithing, we couldn't afford it on paper, but we decided we needed to act like we believed God. And so he's never, that's been probably 20 years ago, and he's never, never left us in the lurch so um, the verse I want to read today is from Malachi it's one of the verses that I always uh, think about when I think about the offering I, I know a lot of you have probably already heard it but it says bring all the this is Matthew or Malachi 3 10 and 11 bring all the tithes into the storehouse so they'll there will be enough food in my temple if you do says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. And I think that's one of the only times in the Bible that God says, test me. And he says, your crops will be abundant for I will guard them from insects and disease. Your grapes will not fall from the vine before they are ripe, says the Lord of heaven's armies. And so uh, when we have that attitude, God does protect. You know, it might be a refrigerator that is about to go out last another five years. You know, there's just so many ways that that we don't see the blessings of God. But I think a lot of it has to do with our understanding of our relationship with him and how it, how it uh, is affected by our finances. So if you just pray with me now, I just... Uh, Lord, we just praise you. You are worthy of all our praise, and you're, and you're worthy of uh, everything in our lives, and including our money. And so I just uh, pray, Lord, that you'd help us have a, a right understanding of our relationship with you and how it uh, affects not only our finances, but all, the rest of our life. And uh, so as, as we give today, we just uh, ask your blessing on it, that you'd multiply it, and Lord, let it supply all the needs that we have. And we give you all the glory for it and for everything else in our life. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. As day unfolds. 